Good morning. This okay? You can hear me? Right. So I found this uh, book of poetry, and um, I was very impressed by uh, many of the humanist style. So I wanted to share this um, female poet with you, Wis Wislawa Zamborska. She was a Polish um, poet, and she was born in 1923, died in 2012. She won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1996, and this is what they said about her then. In awarding the prize, the Academy praised her poetry with ironic precision that, oh, excuse me, her poetry that with ironic precision allows the historical and biological context to come to light in fragments of human reality. So, <laughs> the first one I'm going to share with you is could have. And this is my answer to everything happens for a reason. <laughs> my humanist answer. It could have happened. It had to happen. It had happened earlier, nearer happened, but not to you. You were saved because you were the last, alone with others, on the right, on the left, because it was raining, because of the shade, because the day was sunny. You were in luck, there was a forest. You were in luck, there were no trees. jam a turn a quarter inch an instant you were in luck just then a straw I felt because although despite what would have happened if a hand put within an inch a hair's breadth from an unfortunate coincidence so you're here dizzy from another dodge a close shave a reprieve one hole in the net. I couldn't be more or speechless. Listen how your heart pounds inside me. Thank you, Amy. And now, uh, Maura Bright will introduce our speaker. I do ask that you refrain from asking questions until our question and answer period, uh, which follows a pause after the If I'm tall enough. Okay. John Dakin has been a member of the ethical movement for over 25 years. He's a past president of the Washington Ethical Society and a board member of the American Ethical Union. He makes his home in Silver Spring, Maryland with his wife and two teenagers, and he's still alive to t talk about it. I'm really happy that he's agreed to come up and do this talk, so let's please welcome him. It's wonderful to be here. I had um, a wonderful opportunity. I, I know Jim from a long time ago. Um, I don't know if we overlapped on the AEU board when I served 15 years ago, but I know we've known each other in, in various uh, um, AEU events. Well, and, and he and I and uh, past president of the AEU, Carolyn Parker, did a workshop together um, two summers ago. And of course, uh, Dorothy Dale, who is my uh, fellow uh, board member of the AEU, we've worked very closely together. I consider her my, my closest a uh, 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 connection and ally and, uh, and friend. Uh, I was so happy to make the drive down here to be with you all. I think of you all as be having an outsized influence on the movement. You have, I think, such influential people here. And, and frankly, as someone who is a member of an ethical society that is, uh, we're, we are, co-affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association, as I'll refer to later. Um, whereas you all have a, an affiliation with the American Humanist Association. And if I had my druthers, I probably would be at an ethical society more like yourself. 
I'm a physician, I have a master's in physiology, I'm, I'm a proud scientifically minded person who left supernatural religion to, 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 to find my way to ethical culture. I want, uh, I, I want to bridge the gap between, because I think that my home ethical society and your own has a lot in common. And, uh, and part of what I think is necessary for revitalizing ethical culture is to find the, 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 the deeper, deepest philosophical ground, grounding that I think underlies our movement and maybe can evolve but still a firm foundation which can bridge the gaps between different societies and their particular cultures. I had intended to come and particularly focus on uh, Felix Adler because uh, my society um, has a tradition of having been led for 34 years by a what you might call a neo-Adlerian, uh, Don Montagna, who with several other neo-Adlerians, including uh, uh, Joe Schumann, um, um, previously at Bergen, uh, and uh, the gentleman at uh, um, Long Island, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, and as well as John Hode at, uh, at St. Louis, they rediscovered Adler in the 70s, and, uh, and his philosophy had a pretty significant influence on my own society. Um, Don retired in 2006, and, and we have had um, a diminishing influence of his philosophy, but many societies still do. Um, but when coming here, what I, I began to realize after I, I had arrived and was here is I think Adler's philosophy is less is less operative here. So I'm wondering, are any of you all familiar very much with Adler's thought? Show of hands, perhaps? A little, a little bit, some. So what I, and another, another particular indication, at least for me, was when um, I wanted to learn more about your society. And so I went to your website and I had a chance to look at your, your mission statement um, because I, I wanna try to, part of what I think makes a good address is I speak to you all where you're at, where you're coming from, what brings you here, what your orientation is. And what I realized was that on the website, um, my, uh, my, uh, my talk had a different title and and I had, I had experienced this shift in nomenclature. Um, it's on the AE website. Um, it is uh, in the names of several other ethical societies, as I call them, but many others do not. And I recall that in my own society, there was some poo-pooing about this change in nomenclature. Um, and so I was, um, I, I was intrigued to see the, the AKA and the idea of there being uh, uh, considered to be commonality between the two. So I'm gonna come back to that. <laughs> um, but first, I'd like to talk about, how many of y'all, again, show of hands, saw this article? A number of y'all, particularly the leadership uh, of your society. So this, uh, this was a uh, column that was a, a blog post on the internet that was put up um, a, a little less than two years ago um, by James Croft, who at the time was on the AEU board. Um, he was one of the leaders of the National Leaders Council of the AEU. He was the, the uh, leader, clergy leader of the largest society in the movement and one of our most animating uh, characters uh, in the movement. He spoke at my society and really brought the house down. So for him to post something like this was really quite dramatic. Since that time, he left St. Louis. He, he, uh, he resigned from his post in St. Louis and he left the country. He's returned to his native England. Um, in, the, in the weeks and months after he posted this column, um, there were multiple resignations of clergy leaders from the National Leaders Council, um, a significant brain drain from the AEU board, including our past president, um, past treasurer, um, uh, our, uh, our past secretary, as well as the chair of our leadership committee, which has a significant influence on how we bring up new leaders in our movement, um, and several members resigned from the leadership committee. Part of the reason for this were, were allegations of clergy misconduct uh, that were not addressed to the satisfaction of many individuals. 
Dorothy and I hung in there on the AU board, but the year that followed uh, featured significant discord, uh, and then this past summer, a, a very uh, arduous transition from the uh, um, last leadership of the AU board to the current leadership of the AU board. You all may know that Chris Kamen used to be chair of, uh, of the nominating committee that, that nominates uh, officers, and he resigned from his position. There is a lot of dismay. There's a lot of churn in our national movement. Um, my society almost quit the movement back circa 2004, 2005, 2006. Uh, our leader was very dissatisfied with the national movement, and he convinced most of our board uh, that we should quit. Uh, I was the only dissenting vote on our board at the time. Um, I decided to try to, I ran for the AEU board and served for one year on a platform of mend it, don't end it. <laughs> um, but uh, um, my challenge to the AEU leadership at the time was not very welcomed and I, I left after one year. Um, fortunately, Wes has had a presence on the AEU board in the, in the years that followed and I know that probably Laura Steele overlapped with you, Jan, one of our members. Um, but it has been a very challenging time. We did stay in the AEU, but only just barely. The only way we were able to remain connected to the American Ethical Union was for us to also join the Unitarian Universalist Association, not so much for a philosophical connection, but because we were ap appreciating very much the programmatic materials we could get from them, and we have relied upon their pool of trained clergy, many of whom are either humanist in their orientation or are quite familiar with it. And so we had an interim leader in 2006, 2007, who was a UU, our settled leader, Amanda Poppy, for 12 years from the UU, another interim from the, uh, from the UUA, and now our new settled leader, Casey Slack. So, this is a time of considerable churn. As you all may know, the Chicago uh, Ethical Society, which was probably the fourth or fifth uh, in, in size, they did what we had not done. They, they straight up left. Um, their path was more in the direction of the American Humanist Association. They became a full chapter of the American Humanist Association. Um, they're still alive and kicking. I, I actually spoke with a member of their board uh, last year. Uh, I had the opportunity as former chair of the AEU membership committee to help people who wanted to start new ethical societies. And I decided I would try to just have a little bit of a tether back out to this, this group. Um, and it was nice to say hello to them. So suffice it to say, I'm here to talk about this topic because I do feel that our movement is in trouble. And I hope that you all are relatively insulated from that. Um, I think my own society pretty much is. Um, we didn't quit the AU, but we have been in an arm's length relationship for many years. Um, fortunately, there have been some individuals, myself now, um, uh, um, Sonia Coopers was president of the AEU for a, a, a number of years, I think at least three years. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned, Laura Steele served two three-year terms from our society. And we want our society to stay engaged. We want a vibrant American ethical union. But what might be necessary in order to achieve the sort of reconnection and the sort of, of healing of rifts and moving forward and keeping our movement vital? That's what I hope to talk about today. So I want to return to the, the idea of ethical humanism which I think, if I understand, you all consider to be a, a synonym for ethical culture, just without that awkward word, culture. And after all, I mean, I consider myself a humanist. I mean, you all consider yourself humanists. So this was so fascinating to me as an idea, however, that I actually scrapped a platform I had planned on delivering and I wrote a new one this morning. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, partly from the benefit of uh, some wonderful conversations with John Holmgren, um, we've had some great, uh, great conversations a little bit about your all's history and about how you all decided to embrace um, this frame and other societies have as well. So I'm going to talk about some philosophy. I'm not a philosopher, so I probably will mangle some of this, and in the Q&A, please, please feel free to take issue with what I try to put together here. But I'm going to try to make it accessible. Um, and hopefully to make a few points. So I want to take us back to the 18th century 
and moral philosophy, particularly a couple of, of major figures who developed concepts of how we can think about right and wrong. Particularly Immanuel Kant, who pursued, I think, what he called the Copernican Revolution in, in, in moral philosophy. And his thoughts lay alongside the scientific revolution, which followed some decades later, a century later, the scientific revolution, particularly a figure like Charles Darwin. So we have these two strains of, of thought, science, philosophy. On the left side, in the, in the century after Immanuel Kant, there were thinkers who kept his ideas alive and they pursued something called Neoplatonism. Immanuel Kant believed that, yeah, you're not gonna be able to prove the existence of a supernatural deity, but our, our, our reason can, can come up with, can derive basic moral principles that we can, we can operate under. But it was all in the mind. The Neo-Kantians, or you might call them Neo-Platonists, however, they believed that this function of the mind could actually have a bit of a sixth sense, sort of a moral sense. And they believed that this moral sense reflected the ability to tune in to a transcendent, suprasensible, in the words of John Hode, suprasensible realm of ideal, ideals, ideas of right and wrong that are beyond the human individual. And if this sounds at all familiar, this gave rise to the thoughts of Felix Adler, who was very influenced by this, by Kant, by Neoplatonism. And so his idea, many of his ideas were rooted in this idea that there was something beyond our awareness that we could tune into. He was very wary of the idea that somehow you can use some math problems or something to come up with right and wrong. He, he looked down his nose at something he called scientism, this idea that you can use science to come up with figuring out how you get from what is to what ought to be. He felt that that collapses into secular humanism, collapses into relativism, which he was opposed to. Now, I'm gonna lose my audio, so I'm gonna walk over and point to something and then come back to the microphone. Well, I'll... All right, here we go. So I don't think that Felix Adler would approve at all of the use of reason and science in the search for uh, uh, ethical life. Awkward. But here we are. So let's move over to the right again. So the scientific revolution, the theory of, uh, the theory of natural selection, the whole idea of naturalism takes us to humanism, which because of this pedigree, takes a stance that places it in opposition to religion. Religion is supernatural, humanism is natural. And as the decades have followed, the early, early thinkers behind the early uh, uh, humanist manifestos, it has moved more and more in the direction of standing apart from uh, 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 supernatural religion in the defense of, of human thriving. But guess who did not sign <laughs> any of the humanist manifestos? Felix Adler. Adler did not consider himself a humanist. He didn't want to sign the Humanist Manifesto because he believed that we would lose something precious if we gave up on a tradition that looked beyond humanity for decisions about right and wrong, that he felt that was something far deeper. So maybe you can see why when I tried to understand these two words, why, and I'm a, Chris, I'm gonna advance these pretty quickly. This idea of a mashup between these two words, it, it was, it, it was kind of hard to take in and I had to have a good night's sleep last night to, <laughs> to 
<laughs> to, to think it through. So I do want to give it a try. I, I want to see what I can do with this because I think this really leads to some interesting directions. So I looked up ethical humanism. I had looked at this on the AE website previously uh, and I took another look this morning. So here's a short version of what this says. Uh, uh, ethical humanism, also called ethical culture, is an evolving body of ideas that inspires ethical societies. Evolving body of ideas. It also says, we are not by, bound by any community creed or dogma. Ethical societies emphasize the importance of developing a clear personal, not institutional, a personal philosophy that makes your life understandable and meaningful. So I want to make a distinction between creed and dogma. Dogma is you believe this or else you're out. Creed can be similar to that. Like I grew up in the Episcopal Church um, with, uh, with the Nicene Creed uh, that where you had to kind of lift your hand and recite something or whatever. Um, so, but plenty of people, including, I'm wearing my West t-shirt. What it says is deed before creed. It doesn't say deed not creed. So maybe creeds aren't entirely evil. That perhaps some sort of a core shared you know, fuzzy boundaries philosophy can be a way of bringing us together. And I think that might be called for because in the absence of any kind of official philosophy, we have lots of them. So I read on on the AE website and there was a section called What Beliefs Do Ethical Societies Teach? And there were five of them. Further down, it said, what are some principles of an ethical, again, ethical society? Now we're talking about institutional principles. So before it said it's a personal journey, it's a personal philosophy, but now we're talking about ethical society principles. And so you may recognize these. These are the eight commitments of ethical culture. I don't want to uh, um, focus too much on them, but only to, to note that there are quite a few of them. I think they're all fine, <laughs> but there are quite a few of them. Now, you all are affiliated with the American Humanist Association, and you may have heard of their 10 commitments, which I think is awesome because it kind of pokes fun a little bit at the 10 commandments, but here, here are the HA's 10 commitments. Again, I love them. And if you're like me and you belong to an ethical society that's affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association, you guessed it, they have seven. Again, I love them. I love them all, but there are so many. <laughs> so with so many ideas moving around, perhaps you can see perhaps why if certain individuals prefer number five here and number, you know, peace, social justice here, and uh, um, we're committed to, let's see, democratic process is essential to our task. Um, you can just see how you can have schisms develop. You can have some people say, democracy is too important for us to uh, um, uh, have a particular viewpoint to hold sway. Others may say that democracy is no good if it's gonna lead to oppression, like for example, Hamas was elected through a democratic election at first. So what might it take for us to find some commonality? I'm gonna take a stab at it. So I wanna come back to our American Ethical Union. Part of my theory is that this mashup of humanism and ethical culture reflects perhaps the tail wagging the dog. But by which what I mean is isn't it possible that perhaps your all's affinity for organized humanism and the American Humanist Association might have led you to want to have humanism in the title of your society and to perhaps have the word uh, uh, humanist or humanism in the title of your philosophy. So here I suggest that perhaps we're having a little bit of a tension that organizational affiliation may be partly driving how we think about our beliefs. So here I, I'm describing the American Ethical Union as an organization. 
and here you are, are as, as a member of the American Ethical Union, and you have an affiliation with the American Humanist Association. So my society does not have an affiliation with the American Humanist Association. We're not opposed to them, but we don't have an affiliation. So we're over here. What we did do, like I mentioned earlier, is we joined the very large <laughs> Unitarian Universalist Association, a thousand congregations uh, uh, from coast to coast, you know, untold, you know, tens of thousands of members. So these are the organizational descriptions, but now we can flip them and show their philosophies. So the American Ethical Union traditionally has been a holder of the ethical culture philosophy. American Humanist Association is a holder of humanism. Um, so they, they have pride of ownership of those humanist manifestos, if I understand correctly. Unitarian Universalism, you know, I should say the UUA, has something awkwardly called Unitarian Universalism, uh, which has its own philosophical history, which I could go into some other time, which is a very, very interesting uh, of philosophical and religious history. Um, as it exists today, there are many people who consider themselves UUs, but have a particular favorite, you know, a, a, a pet philosophy that none of them hold them too heavily because they're also not particularly creedal, doc, dogmatic either, but they have different attachments to different philosophies, including humanism. So my concern is that some of the challenges I described in the American Ethical Union and perhaps in how we try to understand our philosophy are damaging this precious little entity in the center here, which may lead to a desire for you all to migrate towards humanism as it exists, and AHA is healthier and much larger than the AEU is. After all, they, they certainly have uh, an ethical orientation, and as they've been rolling out their, their ten, uh, 10 commitments, I, more and more they are embracing some of the things that used to rely upon ethical societies to rely upon, which is like coming up with uh, stances regarding social justice issues, doing their very best to create congregations, <coughs> So you may find yourself, you know, no more central location. And where does that live a place like West that um, we do enjoy our music, we do li enjoy lighting a candle, we do enjoy some of the rhythms of more traditional religions, even though we're, 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 we're pretty skeptical a lot. You know, does that leave us with the, the UUA? I briefly attended a UU seminary. I had considered becoming an ethical culture leader. You can tell me later about my speaking skills, but I, it just wasn't for me. Um, but I did have a chance to get the lay of the land. I attended uh, um, uh, National Leaders Council uh, uh, meetings uh, within the AEU, um, and I wanted to get a more robust, robust education, so I matriculated at a UU seminary in Chicago. And I had a chance to see what UUs are about. I've attended a number of UU services at a number of different churches. And they're fine. Most of them are, are conversant with humanism. Um, they're just a little too woo-woo for me. And, and over time, my sense is that they are becoming a bit less welcoming to the skeptical humanists folks within their, within their ranks. So I'm not sure what that would mean for Wes. So where can we go if we want to try to preserve something in that center? Because I was on the AEU board about 10, 15 years ago when the AEU decided to join the Secular Coalition for America. And I heartily opposed it, and I was outvoted. And I'll describe why. Um, I mean, as someone who is a refugee from traditional religion and supernaturalism, I really do not want a national prayer breakfast, believe me. However, I also believe that public policy decisions cannot be made by science alone. That to get from is to ought, we do need to operate from a moral center. And so the idea that, that the Secular Coalition for America, they would say we need to have, you know, have this separation that religion should not be a factor in politics. Well, that's fine, but if religion's not a factor in, in politics, you know, Pete Stark, we're so proud of this non-theistic member of Congress. 
Well, I imagine Pete does look inside his heart to decide what he's going to vote for and what he's going to vote against. So if he doesn't rely on religion, what does he rely upon? He probably can't do some math problems. He probably does have to look towards a moral center. And I felt that ethical culture is a precious, precious uh, uh, entity and a philosophy that situates itself in the nexus between the supernatural, dogmatic, father knows best, uh, religious orientation of, of much of our country, and the, the hard, hard shell, tables and chairs, this is all there is, uh, kind of hard-headedness of the skeptical types over here, that I, that I felt and I feel that we find a way to reach the head and heart at the same time. And so, so we did join the Secular Coalition for America, the, the world didn't end, but that was kind of where I was coming from about that. So in looking forward, looking ahead, is there a way to find some sort of a, of a nexus of these things that holds together philosophically without feeling like a dogma? See how I do. And here's a slide I forgot I had here. Because if we do, lose a philosophical grounding, we may find ourselves with nothing more than an org chart. Um, I can't remember what my next slide is to tell you the truth, and I, because I wrote this this morning, I'm operating without notes, um, but let me talk a little bit about an opportunity I had to meet, this is about, again, about 15, a dozen, dozen, 15 years ago. I had an opportunity to meet and have an audience with the recently retired um, uh, Dean of Westminster Abbey. So this is the number two person in the Church of England, one down from the Archbishop of Canterbury. And guess what I talked about with him? I talked about the AEU, <laughs> which then as now was kind of ailing, was kind of not doing great. I had Don Montagna in my ear telling me how terrible it was and he, he retired early. I mean, he retired in sorrow about the movement. And what uh, um, what Bishop Carr, Archbishop Carr, said to me was, most movements begin with a bright, shiny, inspiring ideal. And then, often they, they run out of steam. And by the way, if they lose sight of that bright, shiny ideal, then they become more and more a creature of their org chart, of their organization chart. And people start talking about, about their, their turf and conflicts arise, does any of this sound familiar? And so he said, if you want to save your movement, and it was very generous of him because it, obviously it wasn't Christian, <laughs> but he was very generous with saying, if you want to try to rescue your movement, try to find that shiny ideal recapture that shiny ideal and organize yourself around that. Make everything you do inspired by that shared ideal. So there you are. So let me talk a little bit about what I see when I go to most ethical societies, especially um, most of the societies that are roughly your all size. <coughs> that I see um, uh, platform addresses that are about policy, they can be about culture, they can be about community. Sometimes they can be about philosophy. But when Adler rolled out his initial inaugural address way back in 1876, what he said is, we need a place for people to go with their spiritual pains, their spiritual yearnings. That there are a lot of places we can go to get these things. On my first Sunday at, at, at my home society, my first Sunday there way back in 1996, I remember they said that, you know, I think of ethical culture as somewhere between the different things you can do on a Sunday morning. And what, do you, what could you do? Well, some people go, might go to a UU church. Some folks might sit at home and read the New York Times. Ethical culture is about halfway between the UUs and the New York Times. And you know, you can get quite a few of these things from the New York Times but you're not going to get from the New York Times is a conversation about life. Today, you know, we heard tragically about one of your members who might not survive. Um, as I speak, our, our pet cat is clinging to life um, at my home. In September, um, my wife and I and, and my daughter 
saw my wife's father draw his last breath. He was 92, he had a long life, but I mean, these, these are the things that we grapple with, that suddenly, you know, my, my father is 93 and he is in the hospital right now. He may not live to see 2024. I want a place where I can go to think about life and death. One of our clergy leaders, former clergy leaders at West, Mary Herman, helped our family say goodbye to my mother-in-law when she died uh, um, back in 2008. She helped us figure out how to say goodbye when we turned off her ventilator. It was still in my mind and we did the same thing when we all said goodbye to my father-in-law. I find that a place like this offers a way to engage in these deep challenges and these deep questions. How do, we li how do we live lives of meaning? What can make our life meaningful in the time we have on this earth? Especially those of us who don't feel that there's something that comes after. And how do we grapple with a feeling of meaninglessness when sometimes we are beset by some feeling like that? So bringing us back to this idea of ethical culture as a philosophy, which I might make distinct from humanism, if you'll allow me. So I want to do a little bit of a, of a call and response to see if you know some of, you, some of your, your catchphrases. So humans possess inherent <laughs> and dignity, some people say. Here's another one. Act so as to <laughs> bring off the best in yourselves and others. Deed before creed. We know these, right? <laughs> I did this, not this platform, but a little bit of a version of, of this uh, with a group of people at WES who are doing some work to try to, try to reanimate <laughs> some of Adler's philosophical ideas, and I did the same thing. Like, everyone knows it, but we don't, but how well do we know it? Some of us really have a, a craving for a deeper grasp of what the actual philosophy behind it actually is. So I began doing a little bit of research on this. Here's the last one for extra credit. We are all bound up within something called the ethical. Oh, you guys. Fantastic. Now, do you know, can you define it? I'm going to make an attempt. So in, I went back to my Adler in his uh, ethical philosophy of, of life. And I went back and found the places where I had written in the margins. And a lot of what I've written in the margins is basically saying, huh, what, what do you mean? <laughs> I don't agree with some of this, but some of it I do. And, and the, the key thing is at the heart of it, from my reading of it, is a, an elegant set of philosophical ideas. There's no mathematics behind it. You can't go out in the woods and find it. You can't dig it up under the, under the ground. But it's a set of philosophical ideas that interweave with one another in what I think is a very elegant way. And I put it in this order. I don't know if Adler does. But the ideal of the whole, and he uses all kinds of Victorian phrases like it must be ideal and it must be whole, or some version of it. It's hilarious. But, but this idea that in this room, in this town, in this state, in this universe, there is amazing variability of humanity, an amazing variability of, of all of creation, if I can use that term, and that each individual is unique. And that uniqueness brings something that, that the whole is not the same without the uniqueness that every single individual brings to it. And it is because of that ideal of the whole and the inherent worth of each of those parts of that whole. You can tell, I, I forgot some of my slides, what's written on here. The idea of inherent worth emerges from the uniqueness of every individual. It emerges from it. So each one emerges from the other. So the idea of the whole and the uniqueness is what gives rise to the idea of inherent worth for every part of it. 
the idea that you should act so as to elicit the best from others is emergent from the idea of inherent worth. Because if someone has inherent worth, that they're often, if, if they're often a corner, just ignored and not being, being uh, uh, heard and, and, and supported, that is a tragedy because you've lost part of that uniqueness and part of the idea of the whole. So all of these things interact with one another. And he caps it all off with the idea that by enlisting the best from others, you elicit the better or the best. He was an idealist, it's not better, it's best. You elicit the best from yourself as you do that. And the idea is it encircles. So this idea of paying it forward. So you're helping others to help yourself, they help you to help themselves. And it just creates this package. From these three, the idea of deed before creed is a more recent idea. Well, Adler doesn't necessarily talk about this idea, but I think it's certainly, he would be sympathetic to it because from the very beginning of our movement, um, service was a key aspect of what the philosophy was all about. How do we put things into practice? I have a few slides that talk a little bit about some of the weaknesses of that, but this is, a, is kind of a, of a kicker on, on top of the other three core ideas. So that last half dozen slides is kind of the core of what I thought I would talk about today. But of course, I'm coming to a group that, that you know, I don't know. I mean, like I said, Adler wasn't a humanist. Adler wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily feel that you could get to none of those ideas you're going to get from science. I don't know. Maybe, maybe my reason makes me like this. I think it's kind of because I, I kind of like it. Um, but uh, so I want to go back to this, this column here about the idea of ethical culture arising from Neoplatonism. So I think there is a way of rescuing. <laughs> Remember I mentioned this idea that ethical culture somehow is, is evoked from this idea of, of something up that we can't see. So what does that mean? If, if, if we can't see it, how can any of us see it? So how can, any, you know, what's the role of, uh, how do we know these truths? And here's the man himself. Adler did draw upon ideals from Plato. And when I was thinking about becoming an ethical culture leader, I took a course in ancient Greek philosophy so I could try to understand Plato. Um, uh, Kurt Collier taught at, uh, at uh, uh, lay leadership summer school and he explained to us that Adler was a bit of a Neoplatonist. And so I was like, what's a Platonist? And so I, I, I read the Platonic dialogues and came to understand better what he was getting at. And then a lot of things began to make sense. This is a shortcut to try to give you a brief <laughs> description of a core element of Platonic philosophy. That what, what Plato taught was that human beings are living in a bit of a dream world. That we think we see truth. And if you see, if, but they really are looking at images on the wall that are uh, shadows from a hidden fire, which is, which is being uh, uh, shadows that are cast by figures behind them. This is his attempt to just describe what we can be with, with a more modern, like a, like a hallucination, like a group hallucination or something. That people don't see the ultimate truth. So this is, this is his allegory of the cave that most people, they're in a cave, but they don't know they're in a cave. They're looking at, at false images, but they don't know they're false images. But certain gifted individuals come to realize they're in the cave. They find a way out. They get out of the cave and they see the truth. That is light, not from this fire, light from the sun. Adler loved using the sun as a metaphor. That this idea that looking up to see the sun, to see the, 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 to see the truth, including the truth of right and wrong, enables this individual to then impart their wisdom to individuals who are trapped in the cave and not realizing it. He believed that the just polis, the just city, is led not by the strongest general and certainly not elected, 
He was not a big fan of democracy. Instead, he believed in the rule of the wise, that the individual who can see the sun, the philosopher king, is the person who is fit to lead. And for me, when I learned this, it mapped very well onto the idea of Felix Adler looming over, uh, looming over our movement. He lived for 50 years. He started this movement when he's in his 20s, and he, he, he led it until his death in 1933. This gives you some problems though. What happens after the philosopher king dies? How do you know who else is a philosopher king? Felix Adler was very, very picky about who got to be a clergy leader and who did not. Um, and after his, his death, you had several generations, but each generation it became a little trickier about how you determine who has this wisdom. Another problem, and I'll use a metaphor. I don't know how many of you all have seen a movie called The Matrix. Can you raise a hand? How many of y'all seen the movie The Matrix? In the movie The Matrix, it's somewhat similar that people think they're living in the real world, but they're actually uh, plugged into <laughs> this, this, this computer program. They're unconscious and they're plugged into a computer program being fed very complex hallucinations. Well, this, that, that, well, this, this individual played by Keanu Reeves, um, he figures this out. He is the one and he figures out that he is in the matrix. Once he realizes this, then he can just use his mind to stop bullets in midair. He realizes it's all just computer code. Uh, and at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, he's coming to help everyone plugged into the matrix to realize that, that they can free themselves. Sound familiar? So here's the problem if we use this metaphor. If Neo, this character in, in the matrix, is the one who has seen the truth, who can be qualified to hold him accountable? He's the one, right? Adler's the one, he, top, top dog. And so if we go back to this uh, allegory of the cave, so, I mean, so imagine that you have an ethical culture leader, that you've hired a philosopher king. Well, what happens once a year, it's time for your performance appraisal. I mean, here are these people gazing at shadows on the wall. So, <coughs> To my mind, we have a challenge in our movement that we haven't really figured out how do we effectively have accountability processes for our clergy. Um, when I was at uh, my own home ethical society, um, we had some challenges with our own leader. And part of what I worked on in trying to create new policies was to figure out a way to have, by the time Don, Don Montagna, our leader, was nearing the end of his tenure, no one evaluated his performance whatsoever. He chose his own hours, he chose his own salary. So it was quite tricky to figure out, you know, how do the lead <laughs> do any sort of accountability process for their leader. And that broke down at the national level as well. I think we can do better than this idea of a philosopher king. I don't think this is the answer. I'm not sure we can use science to figure out right and wrong, but I also don't think we should be using a philosopher king to, to tell us right from wrong. That reminds us a lot perhaps of, of traditional religions after all. So. I'm getting to the crux of what I want to get at here. Getting back to this 18th century moral philosophy, which gives us Immanuel Kant, Neoplatonism, ethical culture. Let's back up. And, and let me show this for a second here. Let's back up to Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant did a whole lot of rational thinking about how he came up with ethics. He was spurred on to do this work by a philosopher who's a contemporary of his, a little older than him, named David Hume. I told you I was going to get David Hume in there, John. David Hume, who is my, personally my favorite uh, um, philosopher, though I do understand that uh, he unfortunately held very backwards ideas about race. On the other hand, he did challenge this idea that you could use rational thought to come up with ethical principles. His idea was that you feel what is moral and what is not. Remember we talked about this idea of a sixth moral sense? He felt that that moral sense was not something up in the sky and he didn't think it was all about rationality. Rather, he thought it was a little a bit like, eth like uh, aesthetics, that you will know justice when you see it because it feels right. This gives rise to a philosophy of romanticism. 
and I don't think I agree with all the rabbinic philosophers, but it does lead to this idea that we can use our emotional sense, which after all is not so primitive after all. Modern neuroscience tells us that without emotion, we, are, we have a very hard time using our frontal lobes without our limbic system. I'm, I'm trained as a psychi psychiatrist and a physician. So this is one of the things that, that I know about, about modern neuroscience, is that it teaches us that our emotions color our rationality to help us uh, uh, um, draw a sense of what seems right and wrong to us. So maybe David Hume had it right all along. When I was... So I'll just, let me skip this a little bit. Human nature versus rational nature. Kant is rational nature. Hume is human nature. When I was a seminary student in Chicago, I went to a gigantic theological library at the University of Chicago, a, a, a theological school, and I went through an entire library looking for a book that would speak to this. And I, find, I found one book, and it was a good one. Moral Minds is the book that I found. And it postulated that humans have a, what, what Hauser called a deep moral grammar, building an idea that Noam Chomsky, the linguist, said was a deep, a deep linguistic grammar, I think was, was Chomsky's term, that somehow humans learn language. We were just kind of wired to learn language. And there are many different languages, but we're wired to do that. Hauser postulated that people have wiring towards a sense of morality and they looked at how human beings across the globe respond to particular moral dilemmas. And not everyone agrees, of course, but the pattern of responses to moral dilemmas, the trolley problem is what they use and some of y'all may know, John sure did, um, that the response to the trolley problem was the same pattern of responses, some to this, some to that, but the same range and, and ratio of the responses pertained across cultures, even more primitive cultures, uh, anyone, anyone who could get to an internet connection. So I suppose we're not talking about tribes in, in the jungle, but remarkable to, uh, uh, commonality across, across cultures. So perhaps this could be a modern form of the philosophy for our time that draws upon science and it also draws upon the, the, the philosophy of the sentiments. Maybe this is ethical humanism. Maybe we could call it ethical naturalism. We could call it maybe naturalistic humanism. But whatever we call it, if it's something that we can come together around, this could be something we use as a centerpiece for our organizing as ethical societies and hopefully something that will help us mend some of the rifts that have opened um, at the national uh, level right now that you know, Dorothy and I and others are, are grappling with right now. I'm going to have a, just a couple of, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're a little bit tight. Then I think this is a great, this is a great place for, for me to stop and I look forward to hearing your thoughts in, in the Q&A later. We'll have our question and answer period now, but I'll just pause briefly to pass the baskets as we're an all-volunteer organization and depend on the generosity of our members and friends. Thank you. So, John, um, the way we do this is um, people will raise their hands. I will try to keep order in mind, and we'll use. they'll have to use the mic. Um, and... We try and get one round of uh, questions from everybody before we have a repeat, uh, repeat question. Um, I will, yeah, yeah. I've got another one. Oh, okay, great. Well, I guess, can anyone see, yeah, I guess people, folks can see me. So, thank you, John, that was, uh, quite a uh, panorama of history there, a uh, good refresher for us all, and uh, I'm going to, since I have the mic, I'm going to make a remark. I think one of the things that distinguishes us and our feelings about the AHA is our need for congregational community. 
And I think that's a very big, important aspect of why we're committed to the, more to the AEU. Um, okay, do we have a question? Jennifer. I want to say, if you speak into the mic this way, everybody can hear you. We can't hear you when you're talking down like this. Thanks, Chief. Um, so I, I just have a question as far as um, what leadership in your mind would look like going forward. What, do you, what are your thoughts on something like a, almost like a tribunal? Instead of having one person, right, this has worked for other cultures, you look at Native American cultures, African cultures, that use a group of people who are just older and wiser and who've lived life, right, who have maybe more of a moral center than someone who's young and trying to, you know, feast on the world. Um, any thoughts on that and, and how that could maybe be a way forward or step forward? So there are, there's a, there's a couple of Christian denominations that, that use kind of the elder approach. Um, and certainly um, um, indigenous culture richly draws upon that. I can't be sure um, ab about the idea of that. I know that I grew up in a highly dysfunctional family. Um, I grew up watching my grandmother scream at my mother and kind of the blow up, blow up the holiday kind of elders. So, so I, my own personal experience with that, 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 that moral sentiment that, that David Hume talks about, I don't have a strong moral sentiment that older brings wisdom, um, but I know that those cultures offer something. So I certainly wouldn't reject it out of hand. I think it's a, it's a provocative idea. I have a little bit of a comment. Um, you know, it's, we do promote the use of science when we're looking for how to have an ethical life, but we also promote reason. And I think reason is part of what, it's not just math. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to have a little bit of a rebuttal there, that it's a little bit more wide lens than just straight science at least in our society. I, if I can briefly respond, because I think it's a fair, it's a fair point. When I, when, I, uh, when I threw out that comment about math, that was, that was a, little, a little bit, uh, a little edgy there. Um, I, I, I do appreciate the, the whole idea of, of, of reasoned deliberation to arrive at, at an outcome. Fred? Thank you for a great talk. It was really interesting. Um, uh, one, I, I also agree with the, the reason point, which is uh, that Maura brought up. Um, and, and I think you can, to some extent, use a more analytical approach to developing an, a pathway forward in terms of ethical living. Uh, if, you, if you look at how, um, uh, how cultures evolve, how communities evolve, um, how people work together uh, or not, depending as the case may be, um, that you can define uh, principles based on analytical processes that would say, yes, this is good. Behavior that does things like uh, improve the environment, for example is moral behavior in the sense that, uh, and you could, you could analytically say that, because without that happening, we're all in trouble. Um, and so uh, you can use reason and science, I think, to promote ethics in that sense. Um, so I would, I would argue that. I'll say one more little point, and that is uh, years back, we had a vote here to uh, more formally join uh, the Humus Association, and it failed. Um, so we're, I don't know how far our organization is firmly implanted in that realm, so I'll stop there. I guess. Okay. Chris? 
I'll provide a little bit on the background as to how we became the Ethical Humanist Society of the Triangle. Um, uh, our prior name was the North Carolina Society for Ethical Culture. Um, and prior to that, we had still had the Ethical Culture name. In fact, we were the Ethical uh, Culture Society of the Triangle, I think, is, was our original name. Um, but uh, uh, Randy Best was our leader for uh, a period of time. And during that time, um, the uh, national leaders issued a statement about ethical humanism that is uh, a link on one of the pages that you cite. And they talk about ethical humanism and their, their um, footnote said that ethical humanism and ethical culture are interchangeable. So with Randy's um, uh, insights and leadership and that statement, I think we began to see ethical uh, humanism as, as a more modern, understandable term uh, to ethical culture, which, you know, culture itself is like, oh, do you go to operas? Do you, you know, go to plays? You know, what, you know, or... So uh, I think that's sort of where we ended up uh, moving into the ethical humanism name. Uh, and that was not a unanimous vote. Um, uh, there were people here who felt that we shouldn't, you know, change our name. So that's why we, we try to so, sort of put the two together oftentimes. Um, and we certainly still honor uh, those members in the society who have a religious background and honor their religion. Uh, but when they come here, they choose not to cite that as really re, uh, reasons for um, uh, deciding something is right or wrong. It's, we, we focus more on the. Um, so I have more to say, but I'll wait for others to comment. Any other questions? Uh, I want to comment on your bringing up uh, emotion as part of the way to think. Um, many years ago, we had a, a very valuable member of our society who was a philosopher, James Coley. And when talking about these distinctions, he would emphasize emotion as part of our thinking process assessed in order to come to decisions on right and wrong. And we don't really hear that uh, a lot from some of the other uh, conversations about uh, our movement's beliefs. Can anybody else remember uh, what J James used to say about that? He was, okay. It, I, I don't remember exactly, but yeah. Uh, I, I want to make a, a brief comment because I, I think that one of the things I do appreciate is, I mean, you know, that this is this is what you're all about, and I'm, I'm not here to tell you not to, not to be who you are. At the same time, I think that you you may be missing an opportunity to offer something that they're not going to get from the New York Times. That they, I mean, so so. There are secular humanist organizations out there. There's one in Washington, D.C. I give a platform, well, I give an address to them. It was really wonderful. Um, but they weren't a, a vital organization, and I feel like they weren't, they weren't speaking to the whole life like I was suggesting. That I think there is a way to have your cake and eat it too, to have, have the, the, the reason. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry I kind of beat up on the reason idea. I think, I think you're quite right to push back on me that you yeah. can have it all, that you can have the, the love of reason, but also deliver your programs in a way that can, can reach to the deeper things that people yearn to, to, to have in their life. Um, I'm going to just take one more question, unless there's a gazillion hands. Uh, Did you have one, Chris? Uh, touched on it, so I didn't uh, well, I, I was just going to say, uh, one of, the, one of the things I think that drives a lot of us is, is passion, a passion for uh, community goals, a passion for helping others, a passion for um, uh, you know, service, uh, doing um, uh, work to uh, feed the hungry, things like that, for the larger community. And, and one of the things, one of the initiatives we have right now that we're I, at least I feel strongly about, is uh, developing a community of like-minded societies in the area where we're going to uh, co-share programs, committee, uh, you know, um, announcements of what we're doing, 
because uh, our society is relatively small, but we have, uh, we have a lot of energy and I think we have a lot of passion to drive forward to try to make um, this more of a community effort. And so. Uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, today we have a kind of a hard end at 3.30 because the room is going to be used by someone else. So I'm going to have to cut this short. I hope that uh, John will be available for questioning as we have our social time. And, uh, but please let him eat, too. <laughs> okay, so our, now we have a brief time for announcements. Any announcements, Chris? Um, some of you may have gotten an email from someone claiming to be me this morning. That was indeed from me. Um, uh, as, you, as a part of our fall, uh, annual fall process, it's our pledge campaign uh, for 2024. I want to thank all of you who have been with us for uh, uh, even just a few or many years who have uh, contributed, made a pledge, and uh, paid that pledge that helps us to sustain ourselves in this building, uh, which is somewhat expensive. Um, so uh, it's time to pledge for 2024. Um, so please uh, check out that email that I sent and uh, make a pledge. Let us know how much you can give. Um, uh, and uh, uh, now let the, the email, just check that email. Uh, but we'll be bugging you about that for the next few weeks so that we can get our budget made for 2024. Thanks. I've, I've actually stolen a second, Mike. Just to let everybody know that do not come to the building here next week. We will not be here. Next Sunday is Zoom only. Carolyn Parker from the Austin Society and a former president of the American Ethical Union will be doing a talk, and I think it's going to be a really good one. So please join us via Zoom next Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask no more announcements. Marge? I brought some extra 2024 calendars and they're on the table. Help yourself. Okay. Thank you. I will say very quickly, we have Change for Change. Cora is still being supported by Change for Change, so just help us out and drop any extra change you have into the jar. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All set? Okay. Um, I'll call Amy up for closing words. Well, an opportunity to think about dreams, something um, for us to do in the future. So um, this is a more personal poem, but it's in praise of dreams. In my dreams, I paint like Vermeer van Delft. I speak fluent Greek and not just with the living. I drive a car that does what I want it to. I am gifted and write mighty epics. I hear voices as clearly as any venerable saint. My brilliance as a pianist would stun you. I fly the way we ought to, that is, on my own. <laughs> Falling from the roof, I tumble gently to the grass. I've got no problem breathing underwater. I can't complain. I've been able to locate Atlantis. It's gratifying that I can always wake up before dying. As soon as war breaks out, I roll over on my other side. I'm a child of my age, but I don't have to be. A few years ago, I saw two sons, and the night before last, a penguin, clear as day. Thank you, Amy, for your words today. And I'd also like to thank Atish and Christina for the refreshments. And Anna's greet when the, uh, the sign people couldn't make it. And technical help. And all of you for being very attentive. Audience. And uh, our speaker, John Dakin, we're very happy that he was able to join us. So our meeting is over, but our fellowship continues.
turn to someone near you for a greeting and join us for refreshments and uh, conversation. Thank you.